We just observed an experiment in which it was shown that self-propulsion is possible in water based on theoretical conclusions. This could be of great practical importance because this experiment shows that other ways of movement are possible, not just the classical ideas that we already know, the rocket method by means of a rocket engine. Because what this is, is a way of movement by repulsion from the medium. And what it demonstrates is based on the phase difference between two oscillators. We observed practical testing according to the principles described in the book. And we saw that the theorized effect is actually observed in reality. That is, when you set different phases, the boat comes into motion. This indicates that the theoretical principles described in the book are correct. Today we saw the effect that with phase discordance an object comes into motion. When the phase shift is zero, the object does not move anywhere. But with a positive or a negative phase mismatch relative to zero, the object moves either one way or the other. Accordingly, the discussions that we had before the demonstration of the model including the academics from the Russian Academy of Sciences that said that this would not go anywhere, proved untenable, and today we showed the opposite. More than 10 people attended the demonstration and everyone said that the principle works and there is movement. So we didn't set out to make this boat as an engine for the water. We sought to demonstrate that this principle works in all material wave mediums, the air medium, the water medium, and this effect can be applied to the physical vacuum, suggesting the possibility that this method of motion works in the vacuum because the vacuum itself is also a wave medium, having material effects but not being a substance per se. If we have a wave medium which conducts radio waves, why can't we harness this effect? The purpose of this demonstration is not to show how a boat can move with piezo transducers, but to show that this principle can be applied to the vacuum. The principle is as follows. We change the ratio of wave pressures. We don't make the device itself active. We make the medium active. In this active state, the medium itself will move the object. Many claim that this is the Munchausen effect, but today everyone's seen that this effect works, and we didn't use jet engines at all. Absolutely. We're now making the first steps to moving in space in this new way. Yes, these steps are small, as they only show small forces of thrust, but we can scale these thrust forces. This demonstration showed the resonant nature of this effect. This setup is more advanced today than the one on floats that was demonstrated more than 10 years ago. With transverse waves, this effect also works, but many critics said that this effect only worked because we were using gravity to our advantage. But today we've seen that this effect occurs with longitudinal waves, the same way it did 10 years ago using transverse waves. At that time the unit was simpler. Today it's more modernized, so we've shown the propulsive characteristics in a more modernized way. If we make the distance between the emitters a multiple of an integer number of the standing waves, then when the transducer's phases shift, the boat begins to move. If the distance between the emitters is not a multiple of an integer number of standing waves, it stands still, even if we change the phase ratio. This indicates that there are no reactive jets from the emitters. Operation is only possible with a whole number of standing waves between the emitters. Accordingly, if we place passive resonant elements in the gap between the emitters, this will increase the thrust, despite the complexity of the design. But we did not set out with the goal of making some vessel that would move around in a pool. Just a few grams of force was enough to show the principle. So by applying this effect in a vacuum, we can scale the propulsive force by increasing the frequencies. By increasing the frequency step by step, we will get more and more propulsive action. Today we're on the threshold of inventing, roughly speaking, a transistor, which will yield results in the future. History has already shown this. Today we've also shown this effect, and we can scale this effect in the vacuum. But we need completely different technology for this, and we need different equipment. If we develop in this direction, then in 10 to 20 years' time, we will see a fundamentally new way of propulsion, and the technology for this. If we abandon this direction, we will continue to 
to fly on barrels of kerosene, and the technologies in aviation and space will not change. Let's put it this way. If our Academy of Sciences says that all laws are discovered, why do we need this academy? Let's remove it and work on what we actually already have. Well, at the moment, the entire civilized world is already involved in these technologies for space exploration, and new promising types of propulsion are being developed. Quite a lot of money is being invested into this research. There are all kinds of engines being developed, ion engines, nuclear reactors, but all of them have to do with the ejection of a reactive mass. This means that you need fuel on board, but you can't fly very far even with a lot of fuel. We have learned how to get energy in space, and today we claim that energy in space can be translated into motion. With rotating parts, this is impossible. And the next stage of the electromagnetic experiment must involve a large number of specialists, including the development of high-frequency equipment. Completely different equipment is required than the kinds that we have now. With the equipment we have now, we'll get a maximum thrust of one kilogram. This is why we need completely different equipment. A large number of specialists need to be involved in this development. Take the atomic bomb project as an example. It was a gigantic, grandiose project involving 150,000, 200,000 specialists all over the world. If we take another project named Buran, which was the first operational Russian shuttle orbiter, we know that about 2 million specialists were involved in this project. Enormous amounts of money were invested in order to improve the known methods. Now science denies that this method is possible. But we have already demonstrated experimentally, in two experiments, that this method is possible. We're gaining a statistical basis of experiments that show that this is possible not only in a small bathtub. And of course, the reflective waves did not contribute to the propulsion. The next step is electromagnetic, which is what we claim we can do. However, this requires a completely different ultra-high frequency technique, with a frequency range that will produce the first results around 10 gigahertz. Further on, we'll go into the terahertz range. There are developers who suggest creating such equipment, and of course we must involve them in the project as well. According to the first conservative estimates, this project will cost at least 200 to 300 billion dollars to reach the announced characteristics of moving at gigantic speeds. And human energy will also be involved in a large amount. Probably one country won't be enough. In Russia, we definitely can't do it. We don't have the technology to create new hardware. There needs to be international cooperation. This is the kind of cooperation for which we human beings should think. Let's unite. Instead of fighting each other, let's unite in technology. And instead of fight on Earth, let us unite and fly away to develop other resources on other planets. Accordingly, this project must be developed in the framework of cooperation, in which a large number of people will be involved. This is how we see the development of this project. It won't take one year, it will take 10, 15, maybe 20 years. But the end result will be technologies that fundamentally change our lives. After all, with the change in technology, the quality of human life changes. Basically, a different paradigm will be established in society.